Hi everyone and welcome to another seminar of mathematics and high energy physics at Physics Latin. Today we have the honor of having Professor Richard Thomas. Uh, Thomas obtained his PhD on gauge theory on Calabillao manifolds in 97 under the supervision of Fields medalist uh, Simon uh, Donaldson at the University of Oxford. Together with Donaldson, he defined the Donaldson Thomas invariance of Calabellao trifolds, now a major topic in geometry and mathematics of string theory. He is currently a professor at the Imperial College London in UK before joining there. He was a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and affiliate with Harvard University and the University of Oxford. Thomas ha has made fundamental contribution contributions to algebraic geometry, differential geometry, and symplectic geometry. His doctoral thesis, as I mentioned before, introduced new invariants that later became known as the Thomas Tunnels invariants. Uh, motivated by homological mirror symmetry, he produced break groups action on the right categories of coherent sheet. In joint work with Paul Seidel, later on with Chin Tun Yao, he formulated a conjecture known as the Thomas Yao conjecture concerning the existence of the special Lagrangians in the Hamiltonian deformation class, but picks Lagrangians of manifold of a Calabi-Yao manifold. Together with Rahul Pandaripande, he formulated a refinement of the Donaldson Thomas invariance for the special case of uh, curve counting, the Pandaripande Thomas stable pair invariance. With uh, Martin Kuhl and uh, Vivek Shende, he used the Pandaripande Thomas invariance to prove the Gauche -Tec conjecture. Uh, with Davish and Davish Maulik and Pandaripande, he proved the Katz Kleb Bafa conjecture establishing links between the chroma witten theory on K3 surfaces and modular forms. Uh, his collaborations with Daniel Hilbert led to contributions to the deformation theory of complexes. With Nick Addington, he established a compatibility result for two rationality conjectures on COVID fourfolds and many other fundamental works. As you can notice, he has collaborated with a lot of important mathematicians and some of them are giving uh, seminars here. Uh, very soon. He also co-authored a very important book in mirror symmetry, which is now a standard for mathematicians and physicists to study about the subject. He has several important uh, expository notes. His interests are mainly algebraic geometry, modeling problems, and narrative algebraic geometry, the right category, mirror symmetry, and Calabilla manifolds. We are very happy, and it's a total honor to have him with us today. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, okay, so I understand you've been having courses on algebraic geometry, so I'm going to give a slightly different point of view, in some sense easier. Uh, so the problem with introductory courses to algebraic geometry is just always um, that it's too big a subject, there's too many prerequisites, the references are intimidating and thousands of pages long. Um, there's always tons of preliminaries. Uh, and um, it's, it's very hard to get even to a simple example sometimes, depending on the route you take. And part of that is because sort of algebraic geometry has been rewritten to include all of number theory as well. So I'm going to ignore that and work over the complex numbers. And then we have two easier routes in to the subject. One is through complex manifolds. So more differential geometry approach. And the other is the approach I'll take today, which is um, what we're calling spec and proj. Okay, so uh, this is where everything is described in terms of just a single ring. Okay, so spec will describe affine algebraic varieties. So these are the local models of all of algebraic geometry. So you've probably seen in your course um, so I'm going to describe the local models. Um, and then <clears throat> the global models, as you'll have seen, are built from these by gluing. Um, but I'm going to do something. I'm not going to discuss that. I'm going to do something simpler, which is uh, consider projective varieties. Sorry, one second. My phone's going. Um, Projective varieties can be defined by gluing affine varieties, but that's not what I'm going to discuss. They can also be described just like affine varieties 
um, for, by a single ring. And so that's the description I'll give you. Okay, so uh, it makes the subject much easier, uh, essentially because we remove gluing. And we do everything in one go. So there's always essentially one chart. Okay, and everything that I'm gonna discuss is built on this duality, which you've surely seen by now between geometry and algebra. And you know, it, from left to right, the arrow takes um, a space to an, an algebraic object and the algebraic object is the ring of functions on the space. So functions can be added pointwise, multiplied. So you get um, some object of algebra. So in some sense, this is describing a space by its coordinates, but it's a more global thing. Um, <clears throat> and then what we mean by functions depends on what category of spaces we're working in. So I'll just give some examples that you're already familiar with. So vector spaces, then the obvious category, of, uh, the obvious class of functions to take are linear functions. And then there's no algebraic structure. We don't mu um, multiply them or anything. So it's simpler. And so we, we go from a vector space to the space of functions now becomes the dual vector space. And how do we go back? Well, you already know this. We go back by evaluating linear functionals at points. So any point of V, X here, gives a linear functional on V dual by evaluation. And so what you find is this gives all the linear functionals. So what you find is that V is naturally isomorphic to V double dual. So this is how you recover the geometry, the vector space, from the algebra, which is the functionals, the space of functions on it. So you recover V from V dual by dualizing again, by taking all evaluation functionals. Okay, and we'll see um, a generalization of this in a second. And another category you might work on in is compact Hausdorff topological spaces. And then here you can take the complex valued continuous functions. And again, that, that's got algebra operations. There's pointwise multiplication and addition. And then how do we go back? We don't just take linear functionals on it now. We have to take into account the multiplication. But the so we take, again, the evaluation functionals. Okay, so. If I take a point of my original space, that gives me a, a linear map from this, uh, these continuous functions to C, given by evaluating any function at X, okay? And then this has the property, it's not just linear, it doesn't just commute with addition and scalar multiplication, but it's also um, an algebra homomorphism. So it satisfies that applied to F times G, I get the same answer as if I apply it to F and then multiply by the results of applying it to G, okay? So it gives not just a, a, a linear homomorphism, but also a, a ring homomorphism, okay? And it commutes with complex conjugation. There's a real structure here, which I won't go into. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a famous Gelfand Neymar theorem, which says that this recovers X. So this is all of these C star algebra homomorphisms to C. So certainly you can see that points of X give you these C star algebra homomorphisms to C by evaluation at X. And the theorem is that's all of them. So in other words, you can recover X abstractly without knowing. So just from the structures on this algebra here, you can recover X without knowing that this algebra came from X. So you just take all the ring homo all the C star ring homomorphisms to C, and that will recover X for you. And there's a natural topology and so on. You can recover the compact Hausdorff topology as well. All right, but that's a digression. You can forget about that example if you've never seen anything like it. Um, oh yeah, throughout these notes, I've set tons and tons of exercises. I'm not expecting you to do them all, but um, they're just if people want to explore anything further. One or two of them are important to do, but um, these are just for fun. So for instance, you can apply the previous slide to the circle, um, but to make a, a simpler, more algebraic example, what I'm gonna do is instead of taking all continuous functions, uh, just take the finite Fourier series on the circle instead, okay? 
and then check that you can recover the circle from the set of homomorphisms to C from finite Fourier series. And now you can drop the condition about it commuting with complex conjugation uh, to sort of complexify the circle and take all algebra homomorphisms to C and see what you get. So that's a fun exercise. And I will, I'm sure Daniel will post my notes later, so you don't need to write all these out. Okay. And then the example we really care about um, is uh, where we're going to, again, if we take a vector space and it's linear functionals, now I want to allow multiplication. Okay, so I'm going to get not, I'm going to get products of linear functionals. In other words, I'm going to get polynomials. So I'm going to replace W dual by the symmetric power of W dual. So the sum of all the ith symmetric powers of W dual. Okay, so this is all products of linear functions, but symmetric because if I multiply two linear functions, it doesn't matter what order I do it in, I get the same answer. Okay, so I get polynomial functions on my vector space. And, you know, if I choose a basis just to make it concrete for my vector space, uh, my dual vector space, then this symmetric algebra is just the polynomial algebra. Okay, and so the ith piece, the ith graded piece, the ith symmetric product is a homogeneous degree i polynomials in there. Okay, and uh, I think you've all, I think you all know enough algebra that you probably know this. You can describe the symmetric uh, power as either a quotient of the tensor power or a subspace of the tensor power. Uh, and you can describe that invariantly as well without using these coordinates. Okay, but now I don't want to consider W as a vector space. I want to consider it as an affine space because everything's going to be independent of moving the origin. So I'm going to allow myself to translate my polynomials, translate the origin. Okay, so here's an exercise about that. Just check that indeed, if you do a translation on a vector space, you take polynomials to polynomials. Although what you don't do, you don't preserve the degree of homogeneous polynomials. So that'll come up later. So in down to earth language, we're just saying that if you expand a polynomial about a different point other than the origin, you can sort of take its Taylor series about a different point and you'll still get a polynomial. That's more or less what this is about. Okay, so everything we're going to be doing is going to be independent of translation. Uh, and so we're going to call this an affine space rather than a vector space. Okay. So now what does this duality give us in this case between algebra and geometry? Okay, well here again, what you can do is given any point X in W, you can consider the evaluation homomorphism and check that that is an algebra homomorphism. Okay, so it, it commutes with addition of functions, multiplication of functions, um, and multiplication of functions by complex scalars. And that's because all of those were defined point-wise and we're just evaluating at a point. And now it's actually an easy exercise to prove the converse, so not just that all these evaluation homomorphisms exist. So given any X in W, you get an algebra homomorphism, but that's all of them. So there are no more. Okay, so any homomorphism phi is of the form, it is evaluation at a point of W. And in fact, there is the point of W. I've described it for you. So I've, I've done half the exercise for you. Okay, so it's well, you should do this exercise, it's vital. That's why there's a bit of red there. Okay, so um, more or less what this comes down to is the fact that we really only care, because the symmetric algebra is generated by its degree one part, we only really need to know what happens on the degree one part, and then it just reduces to the vector space exercise we did earlier. Okay, so what we find is a duality between the geometry of this space W considered as an affine space, and the algebra of functions on it, which is the symmetric power of the dual space. Okay, and in coordinates, it's just, you know, a duality between 
c to the n and polynomials in n basis functionals. Okay, so again, just to emphasize, we're going left to right, replaces a space by polynomial functions on it, and going right to left replaces an algebra or ring by the space of unital algebra homomorphisms from that ring to C. Or non yeah, I was going to say non-zero, but unital will do it. Unital means it takes one to one. Are there any questions about this? Okay. Uh, well, I want to mention that you can write in the in the chat, and I can read if you don't want to want if you don't want to speak. But it's also very nice if you can just. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so if you're being shy, put something in the chat. I won't see it, but Daniel will. So Daniel will interrupt me, and we can discuss it. Okay. Okay, and another way of expressing this duality is that. So I mean, we've only done this for a vector space so far, but we'll we'll speed up in a minute. Okay, um, this vector, this affine space W is instead, it's also the set of maximal ideals in this algebra. Okay, so um, what we do is instead of considering evaluations to C, we can consider their kernels and those are maximal ideals. Okay, so we can, corresponding to a point of W, I get a maximal ideal, which is the functions vanishing at that point. So that is indeed the kernel of the evaluation. Okay, and then you can check that that's a maximal ideal. And then the converse is harder to show that all maximal ideals are indeed correspond to points of W, uh, but that exercise more or less tells you how to do it, uh, but you, you need to look up a theorem, see how it's proved a theorem in algebra that um, finite field extensions of C are themselves C. Okay, so I, I, uh, I'll leave this exercise for you to ponder later. Just It's just absorbing definitions and reordering them. Okay, so now we get to the things we really care about. Um, if I'm going a little fast, it's because you've already done a course, so somehow I, I think you've seen these maybe in different languages, in different language, but um, do shout if, if you want me to slow down. So an affine algebraic variety is something, affine just means I'm in affine space, c to the n, and the algebraic varieties are just the zero loci in there of a finite set of polynomials. Okay. So in coordinates, I'm taking c to the n, its usual coordinate functions, sort of as linear functionals, and I'm just setting a bunch of polynomials to zero. I'm taking those points x in c to the n, which satisfy these polynomial equations. And now its algebra of functions, we define to be the polynomials, essentially the polynomials on this V. But what, what do we mean by that? Well, we define it to be the polynomials on the affine space, C to the N, modulo, which we can then restrict to V, so we can think of those as functions on V, but then when we do that, some of them are restricted to the zero function. So that's, um, so we divide out, we don't, we take our, our algebra of polynomials to be the polynomials on C to the N, divided out by the polynomials, which is zero on V. Okay. So these include the P's and all functions that they generate. So the ideal of functions defined by these P's, Obviously, all of these vanish on V. So we're going to divide out by those. But actually, there's more. Because maybe you could imagine a function which vanishes on V, which is not a combination of P's, but maybe its square is a combination of P's. If its square is a combination of P's, then it would also have to vanish on V, because its square vanishes on V. Okay, and so um, in general, and similarly, if it, its nth power vanishes on V, then it vanishes on V. So we need to deal with this by taking something called the radical ideal. So we take all functions which aren't necessarily combinations of P, but their powers are combinations of P. Okay, 
And then it is a, a deep theorem, which actually I will set as an exercise right at the end of the lecture. And I will show you, I'll, it'll be an exercise to flesh out the details of a proof. I'll give you a very short proof of this theorem at the end, but called the null Stellensatz, which I'm sure many of you have seen, that um, these are precisely the functions which vanish at every point of B. Okay, are those functions so one of whose powers of which can be written as a combination of keys. Okay, so it's very easy to see that these functions here all vanish on V. The, the null Stellensatz is the harder result, the converse, that functions which vanish on P lie in this radical ideal. Okay, so we just define the ring of functions <coughs> on V to be the polynomials on the affin space divided by the functions which vanish on V. And you can check again, that's a ring. When you multiply two objects in here, you naturally get another object in here when you add them and so on. And you can do that all invariantly without picking these coordinates. So we could have worked in a general abstract affine space instead of picking coordinates to make it look like C to the F. And then the exercise that's in red, so you really must do it. This is, I think, the only one, which <clears throat> isn't hard and you really must do it, is that all non-zero algebra homomorphisms from this ring of functions defined here to C are precisely evaluations at points of V. So it's, again, it's pretty easy to see that evaluation at a point of V makes sense on here. Essentially, that's because evaluation at any of these functions that we quotiented by clearly gives zero. So it's, it's well defined on here. It defines, so evaluation at some point of V defines a, an algebra homomorphism on here. And the hard bit is to prove the converse. But given that we've already proved the converse for affine space, reducing from affine space to this algebraic subset V is not hard. Okay, so we already know, given a, an algebra homomorphism from here to C, you'll clearly get an algebra homomorphism that induces an algebra homomorphism from the polynomial ring to C. You don't divide out by this idea. And we know what those algebra homomorphisms are because they're the points of the vector space that we already saw. And then you need to show, well, if this algebra homomorphism from the polynomials to C descends to this quotient, then you can check that what that means is that these P's must all vanish at that point. Okay, so that's very easy to check. Okay, so it's essentially the first isomorphism theorem. So we're just, so you must do this exercise, dot all the i's, cross all the t's, it'll really help you understand what's going on. So what we end up with is this is the important duality between affine algebraic varieties and their rings of functions. And the, al the arrow going one way takes polynomial functions on the affine algebraic variety, and the arrow going the opposite way takes linear functionals, homomorphisms from this algebra to C, or equivalently maximal ideals, so the kernels of those algebra homomorphisms. Uh, and it's often called max spec, but for this lecture, I'll just abbreviate that to spec, so maximum spectrum for maximal ideals. Um, there's a more general construction spectrum, which you may have seen using prime ideals. It's really not necessary over the complex numbers. Um, it, that's more important in things like number theory for more complicated rings. Because of the essential, because the complex numbers are algebraically closed, the maximal spectrum determines the spectrum. So we will just work with max spectrum. Okay. So now we're going to do everything invariantly and say it all properly. So I've been a little vague on what I mean by an algebra or a ring and so on. So let me start again. So we're starting again. A ring for me means always a finitely generated commutative unital C algebra. So something where you can add, multiply by scalars, multiply, and there's a one. And then a homomorphism means an algebra homomorphism which is unital, so it takes one to one. 
and you can check from the axioms the only other thing it could take you to is zero and that would be just to be a zero algebra homomorphism so we're not using those okay and so we define the spectrum to be the homomorphisms the unital homomorphisms from our ring to c and equivalently that's the same thing as maximal ideals okay and then again in coordinates this is easier it's what we did before because our ring is finitely generated we can pick generators let's call them x1 up to x to the n and then the relations have to be polynomials in those because that's what's once we have generators, then every element of the ring has to be a polynomial in these generators. Okay. So the relations can be written as polynomials in the generators. And then the ring is just the polynomial ring divided by these generators, these polynomials. And the spec of the ring is therefore spec of that guy. And the exercise in red on the previous slide that you're all going to do um, says that this is the points of C to the N. So these ring homomorphisms from this guy to C are just points of C to the N, which satisfy that all those polynomials vanish on. Okay, so it's a very simple thing in local coordinates, and it's a pretty simple thing invariantly as well. And that's the main object of this lecture. Proj is a very similar thing, as you'll see. And so this gives us our duality in an invariant sense between affine varieties and rings without nilpotence. That's because we divide it by the radical ideal that gets rid of all nilpotence. Okay. And always remember it's really simple. You can just read off the equations of a variety from the generators and relations of the ring. So if your ring has generators xi and relations, polynomials in those xi's, then that corresponds to, well, the xi's correspond to an embedding into the vector space on those generators, those coordinates, and the relations give you the equations inside that vector space. And then there's a slightly more general thing called affine schemes, where we don't take this radical ideal, we just take the ideal. And then these are just all rings instead of rings without nilpotence. Okay, so there's always an underlying variety of points, but now what we do is we remember the nilpotent functions. So for instance, we allow rings like this, C of X modulo X squared, in which the function X is non-zero, um, but X squared is zero. So we think of this as not just the origin C, not just the point X equals zero, but as a sort of a fat point, X squared equals zero. So if you think of drawing the graph Y equals X squared, and then intersecting it with the x-axis, y equals zero, then that's what we're getting. We're getting some kind of fat point, so it's a point with a tangency. Um, so x is non-zero on it, because that is non-zero on that tangent direction, but that tangent direction is so small, x square is zero. Okay, but we're not gonna really go into that today. But um, it's just as easy a, a theory as, as varieties, really. Okay, so summarize. We have these affine schemes or varieties correspond to rings or rings without nilpotence. Um, a vector space, oh, sorry, a variety maps to the ring of functions on it, with polynomials on it. A ring maps to its spectrum of maximal ideals or ring homomorphisms to C. A point corresponds to both a maximal ideal and a ring homomorphism. And the link between them is that the maximal ideal is the kernel of the ring homomorphism. And under this correspondence, affine space corresponds to the symmetric power of uh, linear functions on that affine space and in coordinates we've seen c to the n corresponds to the polynomial algebra in the coordinates on c to the n the linear coordinates the algebraic subvariety described by these polynomials corresponds to the quotient ring where i take the polynomial algebra and divide by the polynomials 
And then I guess these should probably be in green. You need to check everything just takes getting used to. All these things are elementary, but it just takes everything in algebraic geometry goes backwards because this passage from a space to the ring of functions on it is contravariant, it's not covariant. So everything's dual and everything's backwards in algebraic geometry and it just takes some getting used to. So if I have an inclusion of sub varieties V inside W in X, then I get an inclusion in the opposite direction of the ideals of functions vanishing on W and vanishing on V. So everything goes backwards. And I similarly get maps backwards. So these are pullback maps from functions on W to functions on V. And these are on too. And you, can, you should check you're happy with the idea that the intersection of two sub varieties corresponds to the sum of two ideals and that the union of two varieties corresponds to the intersection of ideals. And often this is the product of the two ideals, but I think only in the so-called transverse case. And then irreducibility corresponds to primeness of ideals. If these aren't familiar to you, these are either you'll already know these or you won't have put, you don't know what they mean, then it's not so important. Okay, and and so on. You can always fill out the table. So it's it's not just that spaces and rings correspond to each other, but the whole categories. So maps of spaces correspond to maps of rings. And that's what we're expressing here. Okay. And you know, so um a map of V into C to the N, for instance, corresponds to a subject, well, an embedding at least would correspond to a subjection from, or a choice of generators, X1 up to the XN in O of V, all right? Okay, so we've seen all, all these things before. Uh, can I ask something? Yeah. Like, why in the second and third row, you don't have like double line, but just map stuff? Can you not go from the other direction to the... The opposite. Oh, so the, the second row here, V goes to O of V. You mean? Yes. Yes. Why well, you cannot go yeah, to yeah. O? I, I go back on the next line. That's all. I'm just uh, spreading it out over two lines. So I oh, go left okay, to right on this line, and I go right to left on the next line. I just okay, change okay. the notation. It's important to change the notation because if I call it O of V here, it's not so surprising I can recover V from O of V, because O of V sounds like it knows about V. I'm trying to emphasize here that the ring doesn't need to know anything about V, and I can still produce V from it. That's what this third line's about. Okay. okay. So of course, yeah, V and spec R are the same thing, and O of V and R are the same thing. Okay. So some simple exercises. Let me just, one second, and then we'll have a break because then we're done with spec. Okay, this is a lovely exercise you should do. This is this is the reason we call it spec. If you're wondering why is it called spec, then here's the answer. So take an N by N matrix. That generates a commutative algebra inside all matrices by just multiplication and addition. And you could ask, what's its spectrum? Uh, what's its spec? And then you'll see why. Uh, it's 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 related to a spectrum and and that's where the name comes from. So you should do that exercise. Okay, uh, here are some examples of of rings you, which you can sort of draw. You can work out what the spaces correspond to, but also isomorphisms of rings, which therefore correspond to isomorphisms of spaces. And you should try and draw these. So you should try and draw what on earth this isomorphism where it comes from. It it comes from a map. In, in your pictures. So in each of these examples, you should draw pictures, but also maps. Okay, uh, here's another, this is a nice example. Um, here's a map of varieties from C to C2. So at point wise, we just take a point of C to the following point of C2. Try and draw that over the real numbers. No, you won't, don't try and draw it over the complex numbers. Uh, and work out where, where it's not an embedding. And now send A to zero and see what you get. And it's, it's reasonably interesting. And now you should see that set theoretically, it's an injection. So point-wise, it looks like an embedding, but it's not actually an embedding of algebraic varieties. And the question is why and what, what goes wrong? I'm trying to understand that. Okay. Uh, 
And then, okay, uh, so that was spec. Uh, that's kind of half the lecture. And then the next half is about proj. So maybe we take, maybe I, I just ask if there are any questions and we take a break. So proj is just a special case of spec. Um, so where we're going to replace affine varieties by projective spaces. So in particular, we're, because projective spaces are, yeah, okay. Ignore what I just said. Okay, so ex first exercises, check you're happy that alpha and varieties are always non-compact unless they're zero dimensional. So to get something compact, what we can do is replace affine space by a compactification of it. Um, and so the one we use is projective space. So as a set for now, Pn over the complex numbers is just, excuse me, lines through the origin in Cn plus one. Okay, so one way of seeing this is you could remove the origin and then divide Cn plus one by the scalar action of C star. So you can scale up and down a line. You can replace any point by lambda times the point, and that'll describe a line minus the origin. And you need, you know, in this orbit, the orbits of this action C star are precisely the punctured lines. So that's one way of describing it. Another way is to note that any element of C star can be used to make X have size one if you pick some emission metric on c to the n plus one and then you can divide now by the compact group of things which preserve that metric or preserve x having size one so in other words what you can do is instead of describing it this way you can describe it as a sphere of things of norm one of size one and divided by the circle of unit complex numbers. Okay, and in this way you see that projective space is compact. And another way of understanding projective space is seeing it as a vector space union a lower dimensional projective space. So we can do this inductively. So starting at n equals one, we see P1 as the Riemann sphere, as the complex numbers union a single point. And then we can build up so we can see P2. Now we understand P1, we can see P2 as C2 union a P1 and so on. And the way we do that, I'll draw a picture on the next slide, is, is by taking our C to the N and seeing it as a, an affine hypersurface in this C to the N plus one. So it's the V in C to the N goes to V comma one in C to the N plus one. And that's, that, that, affine hypersurface intersects all of these orbits in a single point. So these are actually all give points of P to the N. I'll, as I say, I'll draw it in the next slide. And I'm not, the only thing you miss out is the things where the first coordinate is zero, and that's what gives you this PN minus one. So that gives you all the, all the lines in the original CN. So this is CN union lines at CN. Okay, so I, I'll... Um, I'll, I'll explain this better on the next slide. Um, but what this shows is that it, this PN is smooth. It's really a manifold. It's a complex manifold because the generic point just lies in the C to the N. So it just looks like this C to the N. Okay, you might wonder how this P to the N minus one is glued at infinity. But, uh, you know, this whole thing is homogeneous. You, if you choose any point of projective space, you can make it the center of one of these C to the ends. And so you can see that projective space is actually smooth. So there's many descriptions like this. Okay. Um, so that, yeah, there's an exercise. Okay, so here's the picture. I'm not sure how good it is. This is meant to be a picture of CN plus one. And this green to be the entire sphere, not the sphere in this hyperplane here, this CN. The, the entire sphere, okay? So there are all these lines in black. They all intersect the sphere in circles, remember? So where, whenever you intersect the sphere, you could multiply by a, uh, you could multiply that point by a unit complex number, so a point of the unit circle, and get other points of the sphere. And when you divide by those circles, you get projective space. Okay, so that's one description. 
But another is, is that you notice that all these lines intersect this height here in a single point. So they're really almost all lines are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the points of this affine hyperplane up here. So projective space, at least over a big open set, looks like this C to the N here. Okay, the only ones which don't are the ones which lie in this linear hypersurface here, where instead of taking B comma one, I can take B comma zero. So these are sort of Z equals, this hyper, affine hyperplane is at Z equals one, and this is at Z equals zero, where Z is the extra, the last coordinate in C F plus one, or the first one, depending on your choice. And that's the gray lines. So what you find is you get this CN. So the, the lines are either black, in which case they intersect this CN in a single point, so they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with this C to the N, or they're gray, in which case they lie in this C to the N, and now you have to divide them. Now they're not in one-to-one -one correspondence, unless you draw another hyperplane over here. There now, you need to divide those by U1, so you take the or by C star, so you take this space of lines in this hypersurface C to the N, and that gives you a PN minus one. So we end up with a C to the N union of PN minus one. Anyway, I'm sure most of you have thought about this picture before, and if you haven't, you're not going to absorb it in two minutes. So you need to go away and spend a lot of time thinking about it. Okay, and um, what we're going to do is turn everything into algebra, and the way we're going to do that is just work exactly as we've we did before in a vector space here, c to the n plus one. So we're not going to think of it as an affine space anymore because we keep talking about lines through the origin. So we are, you know, we're privileging the origin now. So we think of it as a vector space. So we're going to work in this vector space just as before, but we're going to do everything c star equivariantly because there's this scalar c star action which preserves the lines and projective space is really just the quotient of this Cn plus one by that C star action. So we're gonna do everything, we're gonna work in Cn plus one, which we already know how to do from the first half of the lecture. And we're gonna divide by the C star action by doing everything C star equivariantly. So I will explain that. And that's all proj is, it's just a C star equivariant version of spec. Okay, so I remind you here, so the C star is acting on the vector space by scaling. And that there it for induces an action on the functions on the vector space by pullback. Okay, and what you find is that under this, the linear coordinates, the usual linear functionals, xi, get taken to lambda times xi. So this is what's called a weight one action of C star. Lambda acts as multiplication by lambda. Okay, but xi to the d, or xi to the d minus two times xj squared or something. So any, any homogeneous polynomial of degree d gets scaled by lambda to the d under this action. Okay. So what you find is that the c star now acts on the homogeneous degree d polynomials with weight d. All right, so we, we really do care about this grading now of polynomials into homogeneous polynomials. Before we didn't because we allowed ourselves to translate and move the origin. Now the origin is very important because it's the unique fixed point of this C star action. So, so we really do care about the splitting. So what we find is that this splitting of the polynomials on our vector space into um, homogeneous polynomials of different degrees is just a weight space decomposition or eigenspace decomposition. Of the C star action. So where this D piece here is where the C star action acts with weight D, so where lambda acts by multiplication by lambda to the D. All right, so this is just replacing algebra by graded algebra or, equi or homogeneous C star equivariant algebra. Okay, so, you know, as an exercise, much of it, this is a very general thing you need to understand which is to do with just eigenspace decomposition or what's called in this case weight space decomposition is that if c star acts on a vector space then the vector space splits 
into a direct sum decomposition where the dth piece is where the, the elements of C star act with weight D. Okay. In other words, they, they are eigen, it's the eigenspace for eigenvalue lambda to the D. Okay, and you have to be careful. Uh, it was part of the exercise to make the right conditions to make this true. Okay, so uh, you need your C star action to satisfy various conditions or it won't be true because otherwise, for, in particular, you don't want a lambda to act through lambda bar or lambda bar to the D. Um, so if you just demand continuous, for instance, that, that will be possible. But so under the right conditions, um, this is true. The exercises to find them. Okay, so what we find now is that homogeneous degree D polynomials are C star equivariant. They're not really invariant because when you pull back by lambda, you don't get back F, but you get F times something. So that's called equivariant. Um, so in particular, homogeneous degree D polynomial does not define a function on projective space. If it was invariant, it would, because it would have the same value on the whole C star orbit. So invariant would mean that as you move around the C star, as you act by C star in your vector space, then your function would take the same value on the whole C star orbit. In other words, on the whole line. And therefore it would define a well-defined function on the quotient. It would, a point of the projective space is just a line and if your function takes the same value on the whole line, then it, it obviously takes a value at the point of projective space, even by its value on that line. But because it's not invariant, it doesn't define a function on projective space because this function takes all kinds of different values on the line because of this D here. However, where it vanishes, if it vanishes, then you can multiply it by lambda to the D all you like and it'll still vanish. So it's zero locus in projective space still makes perfect sense. So the lines on which it vanishes make perfect sense. If it vanishes at a point of a line, then it vanishes at all points of the line. So it's zero locus makes perfect sense. All right? So another way of saying that is that if you have a homogeneous polynomial and you take it zero locus in the vector space, then that is C star invariant, even though the function is not C star invariant, the zero locus is. So you get a cone. So it looks something like this picture. It's, it's a bad picture, but it looks something like this, where you'd have this sort of red object, which is something like the, the zeros in projective space from the previous sentence, this thing. And then the cone on that is some object in the vector space, and it's C star invariant. Okay, so it's sort of ruled. You take any point on it, act by C star, and you're still on it. And you go through the origin. You have this cone point at the origin. Okay. And so what we're going to be concerned with is homogeneous polynomials in projective space like this. Uh, and equivalently, we're going to be concerned with these cones in a vector space. They're the same objects. Okay. And because we understand algebraic subvarieties of vector spaces, like these cones, because that's what we already did in the first hour, uh, it means that actually we, we already understand all this. Okay, so we're going to define projective varieties to be zero loci of finite numbers of homogeneous polynomials. We already decided that makes sense when they're homogeneous. So they're not quite C star invariant, but they are C star equivariant, and that's enough. So that, that's why we. That's why we have to take homogeneous. Otherwise, they, they have no relation to the C star action and they just wouldn't make sense. And equivalently, we take this cone in, in the vector space. So this is cone just means invariant under the C star action. All right, and then we note the following. And then using this, we'll make a rigorous definition. Okay, so we note that points of the projective space which are zeros of these homogeneous polynomials, correspond to lines in the affine cone through the origin, okay? Because points of projective space are lines in the vector space. Right? And now what's a line, 
a line in x tilde through the origin, well, it's it's a subvariety, so it's, it gives you an ideal of functions which vanish on that line. Okay, and because it's a line because it's C star invariant. The ideal is also C star invariant. Okay, so what we get is a C star invariant ideal. So that's remember, ideals are in one to one correspondence with sub varieties. And uh, C star invariant ideals are in one to one correspondence with C star invariant sub varieties. Okay, so we get a C star invariant ideal. Well, of course, there's many more C star invariant sub varieties than lines. So we, we, what signals what picks out the lines is that they're the smallest C star invariant subvarieties, except for the origin, which we'll ignore because the origin doesn't appear in projective space. Okay. So what we find is that these lines correspond to maximal C star invariant ideals, but not quite maximal in the sense that we had, sorry, try again. So not maximal, remember maximal ideals before when we were doing affine algebraic varieties corresponded to points because they corresponded to minimal subvarieties, the smallest possible subvarieties. Here we're interested in C star invariant ideals. So the only points which are C star invariant is the origin. And we're not interested in that, so we're going to throw it away. So what we do is we ignore what's called the irrelevant ideal. Okay, so the irrelevant ideal is just the maximal ideal of the origin. If we throw that away, now we take maximal C star invariant ideals. They correspond to minimal C star invariant subvarieties. Well, there's no C star invariant points left. So what we get is these lines. Okay, so what, what we get is these, these ideals are, are maximal and they're C star invariant. What that means is they're maximal homogeneous ideal. So a homogeneous ideal is one generated by homogeneous polynomials. So are there any questions? So this, this is the key point which motivates the definition. It says that um, points of our projective variety are things we already understand. They're lines in our vector space. And lines in our vector space correspond to certain ideals. They're the, they're the homogeneous ideals or C star invariant ideals. Uh, which are maximal after you've thrown away the irrelevant idea. All right. And so proj is C star equivariant spec is just defined now. You could, you could do it yourself. Okay. So what do you do? You say, I take <clears throat> the ring of functions on my cone. So in other words, I take my polynomial. In the generator in coordinates, I take the polynomial in the generators and divide by the, sorry, I take the set of polynomials or this, the ring of polynomials in my generators, and I divide by the polynomials cutting out my projective variety. That's my natural ring associated to the space. It's graded. That's what the C star action, remember a C star action is essentially equivalent to a grading splitting into weight spaces. So it's graded by a homogeneous degree. And then we have a natural way to go backwards, recovering X tilde as the spectrum of this ring, when we forget the gradient, or better, X, so the quotient of X tilde by C star, X, which is the proj of the graded ring, so these are the points of projective space, X in projective space. These are the maximal homogeneous ideals in R. So we just get the same duality as before, either by working with the cone and doing everything C star equivariantly, or what that motivates is just this more direct construction of proj, where proj is the maximal homogeneous ideals in R, where remember the inverted commas around maximal were defined on the previous stage page maximal always means maximal amongst those ideals which don't include the which you know, when we ignore the irrelevant idea okay and this is the reason this isn't you know i haven't said this too cleanly as a definition yet is because we need to sort of unpack this relationship between x and x tilde and the best way to do that is using a certain line bundle Okay, so 
we need to understand the topological line bundle on projective space. Okay, so Pn carries a natural line bundle on it. Okay, in other words, at every point of Pn, what is a point of Pn? Well, it's just a line in Cn plus one, and so we just stick that line over our point of Pn, and that's our line bundle. Okay, so this is just a, a varying family of lines, and the line over the point of Pn is the corresponding line in Cn plus one. So it's total. It's, it's hard to describe because it really is topological. Okay. In other words, a better way of describing this line bundle with this intimidating looking notation O minus one, you should ignore that. Um, that's for other reasons. Uh, we can describe the whole total space of the whole line bundle on Pn in the following way. It's the space of points in Pn. So these are sort of lines through V, where V, v is some non-zero point of Cn plus one. And then points of Cn plus one, which are scalar multiples of V. So they lie in the, the line spanned by V, okay? So that's, I, I haven't defined line bundle, but you can see that is a, let's say, a set which naturally maps to projective space and the fiber over any point of projective space is the corresponding line in Cn plus one. Okay. So you we, can see- We learned, we learned uh, line bundles in the course. Ah, terrific. Okay, so you can check that this satisfies the definition that you learned. In other words, that it's locally trivial and glued by algebraic transition functions, but that's an exercise, okay? I'm just telling you what it is as a set, but you know, you can see I've defined it by algebraic equations, so it's obviously gonna be an object of algebraic geometry, and it will fit in with the definition you see. Okay, so that's, that's one point about it, but this line, you can, this line bundle you can see in a different way by projecting to W instead of V. So instead of projecting to projective space, we can project now to the vector space because W points of these lines actually lie in the vector space. Okay, so we can project to the vector space and this will help us picture this line bundle. So usually this is an isomorphism. So you take any point in the vector space other than the origin, then what's the fiber? Well, it's the point w and then which line well it's the line through w and there's a unique line through w okay so you should go away and think about this but over the origin it's different because um there's no longer a unique line through the origin there's any line goes through the origin so what you get is that the fiber is the whole projective space over the origin all right so here's a picture is that you have projective space with this line bundle over it, which, you know, I've had to draw as if it was trivial, but it's not. And this maps down naturally to the original vector space, okay, where these lines become lines through the origin. And the only place that this isn't an isomorphism is over the origin itself, where we see all the lines, okay? So at the origin, we remember which line we came in on, and that gives us this fiber, which is the whole projective space, okay? And this technically is called the blow up of the vector space downstairs in the origin, but you don't need to know that. And there's Hartshorn's picture. I don't know which is more helpful. Okay, so the exercise is to show that this is a line model in the sense that you've already seen. So it's, it's a trivial over big open sets, those C to the Ns that I showed you before. And you can work out where the transition functions are. You should do this over P1 to start with, because that contains all the ideas. Uh, you can see what the transition fu um, functions are between different trivializations on different open sets. Okay, and you can get a feeling for this. It's super important to understand this line bundle um, and why it's non-trivial. So an example is that you should check that its circle bundle is the Hopf bundle. Um, and that if you do everything over the real numbers, so you take real lines, um, then you get a Möbius band. And in particular, if you set the sphere bundle here, so now a real line, the sphere is just S0, it's just two points. 
as I've been drawing all along. It's no longer a circle. And those two points are describing the Mobius, the boundary of the Mobius band over a circle. Okay, so these are good exercises to do to get a good feeling for this, this line bundle. And it's over the whole of projective space, but obviously you can restrict it to any algebraic subvariety of projective space. And that is basically, this line bundle is basically the cone, okay? So just as back here, this line bundle over projective space is basically the vector space. They just differ at the origin. And now all we're going to do is replace this nice round projective space with a more squiggly algebraic subvariety and draw exactly the same picture. Let me show you. There you go, you see. <clears throat> so, so basically, you should think of this line bundle over X as being the cone, okay? They only differ at the origin, where we've replaced that singular origin by a copy of X. Okay, so that is the picture. You have a line bundle on X, and it maps down to the vector space, because any point here is a point in a line, and that line is in the original vector space. So you just go to the point in the line in the vector space, okay? And the image is this cone, this X tilde, and it's an isomorphism away from the zero section. And on the zero section, it just contracts the whole copy of X down to the origin. But these two spaces are basically the same. They're, they're similar enough that the functions on them are going to be the same. Uh, and that's, that's going to give us a, a good way of describing this proj, which so that then I can just make a formal definition. Okay, so before, remember, we had these functions on this vector space, or by restriction, we had the functions on this cone. We can just pull them back now and we get functions on here. And so what do they look like? And what do they look like on the fibers? Well, this is what we work out. So we take a homogeneous C star equivariant polynomial, of degree d, say, it's a function on that vector space. Uh, let's do the case to start with, of course, where x is the whole projective space, OK? So um, it's a function on the vector space. So it's not a function on Pn, because it is not C star invariant. It scales. But it is a function on that line bundle, OK? So. You take a homogeneous function downstairs, you pull it up here, and what you find is it is not invariant on these lines. So it's not really a function on the quotient on, on the red thing. I don't want to confuse you. I mean, you could restrict the function to the red thing, but you'd always get zero. So anyway, but the, the point is these functions are not invariant on these lines, OK? But they are at least defined on these lines. And the fact that they're homogeneous in degree d means that they are degree d functions on each uh, line. So for instance, let's take d equals 1. And they're linear on each line. They're linear functions on the line. They vanish at the 0 on the 0 section. But what's a linear function on each fiber of a vector space? That's just a, a section of the dual line bundle. It's a linear function on each fiber. So that's, by definition, that's the section of the dual line bundle, which is called O1 instead of O minus. And similarly, for general degree D, something which is degree D on a fiber, on a line, is the dth power of a linear function. OK, because when you're in one dimension, once we restrict it to a line, so we're in one dimension, then the symmetric power is, that the, is just the power. Just um, once you only have one coordinate x, then the degree, poly degree d polynomials are just generated by x to the d. Okay, so what you find is now you've got the dth power of a linear function. Okay, and so actually that lies in the dth, dth tensor power of the dual line bundle of linear functions. Okay, so what you find is that these functions, they aren't quite functions on Pn but they are sections of line bundles, okay? So the degree d homogeneous functions on c to the n plus one are the same things as the 
the holomorphic sections of this line bundle O of D, which is the dth symmetric, the dth tensor power of this dual of the tautological line bundle. All right, so again, if you've seen this, it's probably just a slightly different language from what you're used to, and you should try and understand it in your language and understand the relationship between the two different approaches, and that'll be really good for you. If you've never seen this before, just try and get a general feeling of what I'm doing. You're not going to absorb it in five minutes. You need to go away and think about it. Okay, so what we find is the right way of saying everything I've been saying is instead of thinking of these functions, you can think of functions that always on the vector space or on the cone. But once you're on the projective space, you should think of them as sections of line bundles. Okay, so, so my x is really as the zero locus, not of functions on projective space, because we agreed they weren't functions on projective space. So, but amazingly, we could make sense of their zeros, and that was because really they're sections of line bundles on projective space, and what, <coughs> where they vanish is on x. Okay. So I think I've said that before. Oh yeah, so now I'm just restricting back to x. Instead of working on all the projective space, I'm now restricting to x. And so now I can say, well, the C star equivariant functions on this cone are the same things as the sections of line bundles on this projective variety. Okay. So um, what we end up with is that the, the functions on the cone are just the degree d homogeneous polynomials, so the sections of O of d, modulo those which vanish on x. In other words, the degree d part of the homogeneous idea. Okay. So now we can express them properly. So that graded ring we had before, which was the functions on the cone, we're now going to think of as sections of line bundles. So what we find is that the, the, the right way to describe the graded ring, or one way to describe the graded ring, so we can do the simple way, we think of it as functions on the cone, graded by the C star action. Or another way is we can think of it as functions on the line bundle, O minus one, which according to their degree split as sections of all these um the dual of that line bundle and then all its powers okay so that's our graded ring so it's graded means you know it's got a, a d piece for every integer d and a or positive integer here and the d piece is the sections of this d power of the O one line bundle. Okay, and then conversely, if we have a graded ring, we can get back all the geometry I've told you about. So first of all, we can take its spec. So that gives us some kind of cone because it has a C star action on it. The grading means that R itself has a C star action, where the D graded piece C star acts by lambda to the D, weight D. So we end up with the spectrum also has a C star action. And so we end up with a cone. And then from that, we can get the variety, which is just the lines in the cone, or the quotient of the cone by C star. Okay, we could say, well, X, so this is called the Proj construction. We're taking the lines in X tilde, or in other words, the maximal homogeneous ideals of the, of the ring. And the other piece of information we get is not just X, but we get a tautological line bundle over, okay? Where the, the line bundle, what is it over a point? It's just the corresponding line in the cone. Okay, and what this does is it specs, sets up a nearly one-to-one -one correspondence between graded rings and varieties with line bundles on. And there's a few caveats to do with the line bundle being positive and to do with what happens when you replace the line bundle by its powers. And to do with, this isn't quite one-to-one -one because of that irrelevant ideal. I can change things in finite dimensions by things which are concentrated at the origin, which is kind of irrelevant to the story.
And so this isn't quite one-to-one, -one, but more or less. So this isn't quite as pure as the spec story. And there's, there's a few subtleties, but don't, if this is the first time you see it, you shouldn't even think about it. Okay, you should think of it as a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, so that's the project construction. So we now, so spec was, we took a ring and that was the same thing as an affine uh, variety. Proj, we take a graded ring or a ring with a C star action. And we get now a projective variety with a line bundle on it, which is just the O1 line bundle on projective space restricted to our projective variety. So any questions about that? I mean, if, if this is brand new to a few of you, those people should concentrate on the spec side of things. For many of you, I think you might have seen a lot of this, but not from this point of view of emphasizing the C star action. So, it's, but that's very important because that's the geometry and what's going on here. So you should really try and convince yourself that whatever you thought of as proj before is really a C star in their equivariant way of doing spec. And if you think, well, I, I had a better, I had a different way of doing this and it worked for me, so I'm going to ignore all this, you'll come a cropper later on if you carry on in maths, because if you don't understand things this way, then um, life becomes much harder later on. Maybe you can point out a good reference for, for, this, for this approach. Yeah, these notes. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, so the problem is a lot of these references were written in the Bourbaki days where people didn't tell you what to think about. They just hid behind theorems and proofs. So if you look in Hartshorn, he doesn't mention C star actions anywhere. And of course, he's doing things over in more general fields and so on, but he could have mentioned GM actions. Um, instead, he just makes a definition. He doesn't really motivate it geometrically, um, and that, and of course, you know he knows the geometry, and he's hiding it from you. And it's really important to know the geometry when you come to do this kind of thing in much more complicated situations. So yeah, I'm not sure of a good reference there, to be honest. Um, I'm sure they they surely exist, but I'm not sure what they are. Yeah, because I have seen all this from the um, Daniel Hubrick book, but this is from the manifold po point of view, like differential right. geometry. Oh, okay, great. In fact, I, I was going to say that is it, you you know it's most likely that a, a complex manifold book is going to do this much more likely than a, an algebraic geometry book. If I'm, yeah, and so yeah, Hoybrecht's uh, book is definitely the one to use great so if that's i had forgotten that this is in there if it is so if it is then that's that's the reference okay okay so in this way we get more or less the same duality as before so projective varieties are basically the same things graded rings um variety with line bundle gives you a graded ring by taking sections of all the powers of the line bundle Conversely, a graded ring gives rise to a variety by taking proj and then taking the O1 line bundle on projective space and restricting it to X. One way of saying it. Okay, points of the projective variety correspond to maximal in that sense of ignoring the irrelevant ideal. Um, maximal ideals in the graded ring, homogeneous ideals, by the way. Projective space corresponds to the um, polynomials on uh, the coordinates on the underlying vector space. So notice there's an X zero now, so there's one more coordinate. And then projective varieties described by vanishing of polynomials, homogeneous polynomials, correspond to this graded ring where we divide by this homogeneous ideal. 
a map to projective space is basically the same thing as generators of your graded ring or yeah, things in degree one of your graded ring or sections of your line bundle. But in order to map to projective space, you're going to need these sections to be non-zero. So um, if you don't take enough Sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> there is a question on the chat. Maybe I read for you. It, it says if the ring R has a really huge cardinality, the corresponding space has still the cardinality of the continuum. Uh, um, that's an exercise. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure I know what I mean. I haven't thought about it. Anyway, for me, all my graded rings are all my rings are finitely generated. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I'd have to think about it. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you just, you have to be careful here because um, when, you, when you take coordinates of a point in projective space, they'd better be non-zero because we've thrown out the, the origin in the vector space. So we've thrown out the irrelevant ideal, okay? And so similarly, if we take a map from X projective space, we don't want to end up, we can describe it as sort of a map from the co and X tilde to the vector space, but we don't want it ending up at the origin. And then we're in big trouble because then we don't get a point of projective space. So you have to think about what that means. Um, and you have to, what it amounts to in, in the original affine or vector space coordinates is that if, if X goes to, I mean, if you remember before, a map from X to a vector space was corresponded to just picking N functions. Um, so N elements of your ring. Here, what you don't want is that these functions vanish. If they all vanish at some point X, then we end up at the origin of the vector space, which does not correspond to a point of projective space. So you have to be more careful. So you end up with this condition that at least one of these sections has to be non-zero. Otherwise, you won't get a map. You'll only get what's called a rational map. Okay, and then you can check that your map is an injection if and only if the SI separate points. So, you know, if you have two separate points, then there's some, some of the SIs can see that they're separate. They take different values at those points. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe this is all a bit advanced. I, I ignore that for now. Can I okay. ask a question about the irrelevant ideal? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, um, by the construction, we kind of recognize this ideal, but what if you have a general ring, how would you recognize which ideal is the relevant? Yeah, so my graded rings are all finitely generated. So take a bunch of generators in, in positive homogeneous degrees. I don't take one. Don't take anything. Don't take the, the function one, which is in degree zero. So take take a bunch of generators in. No, in fact, yeah, sorry. Let me just say it's invariant. The invariant, the irrelevant ideal is the positive degree part of the ring. So it's the homogeneous ideal defined by R1 plus R2 plus R3. So everything except R0, everything except the degree zero part. Okay, that is the irrelevant ideal. So it's it's the direct sum of all these pieces over d greater or equal one. That's the irrelevant ideal. Okay, thank you. Sure. sure. Okay, uh, there's this. If I've lost you by now, don't worry about it. I'm I'm finishing up. So so um. An invariant way of describing these maps on the on the previous page is just to say once I have some sections of a line bundle, so I could take here all of them, or I could take a subspace, then I can map X to projective space. In fact, the projectivization of the dual of that, so everything always gets dualized in algebraic geometry, via just evaluation again. So we take a, a point of my X gives me a way of mapping these sections to the complex numbers, how? By evaluating a section at the point, and where does that land? It lands in the line over that point, okay? So I take a section of a line bundle, 
evaluate it at a point, and I get an element of the line over that point. And because it's a line, it's abstractly isomorphic to C. You can pick any isomorphism you like, and, and that will give you some kind of complex number here. And it's only defined up to scale because I could have picked a different isomorphism. And that's the problem we're always getting from. Um, this is why functions are defined in projective space. So it's only defined up to scale, but as a, an element of the projective space, it's perfectly well defined because point in projective space is only defined up to scale as well. Okay, so, so you end up with an SX at least up to scale. And that, that gives me, so this FX isn't really a linear functional, but it is a linear functional up to scale. So it's an element of not V dual, but sort of V dual modulo C stuff. So it's an element of P of V dual. Okay. And so this gives you a way to map any variety to projective space once you pick some sections of a line model. This is called, when this is an actual embedding, this is called the Kadira embedding. And Kadira tells you when it's an embedding, but I won't go into that now. Okay, so um, I think this page should really be in green. This is an exercise for those who've seen some of this before. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish up with some exercises. I'm basically done. So one exercise is sort of um, add in the caveats to the last table, which make it true. Okay, so because I could stick in some functions at the origin, which are maybe nilpotent or something, and they won't affect anything. Uh, so because I can change my cone at the origin, if I do it in a C star equivariant way, so if I change my cone by adding some kind of fat subscheme at the origin, nothing will change in projective space. So think about that geometric, so that's the geometric origin of the ambiguity in the table, is that I can change this, if I have a cone, I have a C star invariant subscheme or sub variety of affine to a, a vector space, I could change it at the origin, as long as I don't change it anywhere else, but if I just change it at the origin by maybe adding some fat points at the origin, then that won't affect the projective variety because the, the first thing we do in projective geometry is throw away the, that, the origin or the, the relevant idea. So what that means is you can actually alter the graded ring and, so it, um, and it won't change X and L. So, so the correspondence I gave you in that table is not quite perfectly one-to-one. -one. It's many-to-one. Okay, so um, if you're an expert or you know a lot of this stuff, then uh, you can do this exercise and, and make that and work out what the correct thing to say there is. Okay, completely different exercise is the following. We haven't discussed the Zariski topology. That's one of the beautiful things about this approach to algebraic geometry is we haven't really needed it, but now we could invent it in the following way. So notice when you have a topological space, the closed sets are precisely the zeros of the continuous functions. Okay, so now we're interested in algebraic varieties, so we're interested in polynomial functions instead. So let's suppose we work just with affine varieties for simplicity. So then we have polynomial functions on them. So now just define closed sets to be the zeros of polynomial functions. And then the open sets to be their complements, and that is the Zariski topology, okay? So um, that's a very useful thing. It's hard to visualize because it has these enormous open sets. It doesn't have any small open sets. But that's because nothing, that, that's, a, that's a feature, not a bug. What that's telling you is that, um, good things happen over enormous sets. Things are constant over enormous sets and they're only bad on very small sets. So that's something I could talk about for a long time, but I won't do. Okay, another exercise is to uh, do spec G equivariently when G is a finite group in a, as a way of forming a quotient of affine. So this is a way of, this is the correct way to form quotients in affine algebra geometry. You have a group acting on it, algebraic variety. Um, another example is something to do with the real numbers. So consider this ideal. Notice it's maximal. And, um, but it doesn't correspond to a point. 
so, but nonetheless, we can consider the quotient and wonder what it is. And um, that exercise is about that. I won't ruin it for you. Uh, there's a way of passing backwards and forwards between affine varieties in C to the N and projected varieties in its compactification P to the N. So geometrically, you're taking closure. Algebraically, you're doing something called homogenizing polynomials. Okay. So uh, that exercise is there about that. Okay, there's the degree genus formula. Um, described geometrically. So that's another exercise for sort of experts. And here's another tricky exercise. Again, this is for people who know a bit more. So um, the, this, this relates to the affine examples right at the start of the lecture. This is compactified versions of it. So you get certain uh, cubic curves degenerating to certain singular cubic curves. Um, and the singular cubic curve is basically a P1, but it's not quite. Uh, the P1 map is in it's the inject is the image of an injective map from a P1, but not an embedding by a P1. So if if you do the earlier example in affine geometry, then this is the projective version, and it tells you something very interesting and surprising. But this is probably to advance uh, an exercise for a first course. Oh, and there's one other problem with that table I gave you before, which is that we can replace any graded ring by just some part of it, like the even part of it, or you can, instead of taking all D, you can just take all multiples of three or all multiples of seven or something. And what, what this corresponds, so this exercise is saying, if you do that, if you take this subgraded ring, what does that correspond to in geometry? And it basically corresponds to identical geometry, we're just changing the line one. So that this sort of works you through that in the case of uh, replacing R by this R to 2D. Okay. Um, and then the final exercise is to prove the Nordstellens acts that I used earlier. So I think you've probably seen this before. And this is a quick geometric proof. So I, I impel you. I, encourage you to draw everything where I say draw it, okay? So the Nordstellens that says if a function vanishes on an affine algebraic variety, like this, then actually at least some power of that function is in the ideal. It is an, a combination of these polynomials. So we're going to try and prove that. So how do we do it? We'll work away from the zeros of this function. Okay, now remember, the function vanishes on V, so the zeros of the function contain V, okay? So we're working away from that, so V should be empty now. So we're working away from V in particular, all right? So this ideal we would expect now to become just one, is the ideal of the empty set. And that's what we want to prove. So what we're going to do is, because we're working away from F equals zero, so the advantage of doing that rather than working away from V is that V is described by many polynomials, but F is one polynomial. So if we just remove F equals zero, it's very easy to describe that. It's described by this ring, okay? So we work in this ring and we say, well, is this ideal one or not? Well, suppose not, then it's, because it's a non, then it must be a trivial, a non-trivial ideal. And therefore it must be contained in a maximal ideal. So that uses maximum choice, I guess. Okay, and therefore, because it's contained in a maximal ideal, I get a point. And therefore, I get a point of. So because it's contained in a maximal ideal, the point is contained in the zeros of these P's. So in other words, I get a point of V um, in the locus where F is zero, uh, in the locus where F is non zero. But that's a contradiction of my original assumption. Okay. So actually, this ideal is the whole, is just one, at least in this ring. And what that means in the original ring, you can work through algebraically, and you just see it's, it's the um, North Stellar that it gives exactly what you want. 
So this is a very quick and easy proof of the more stubborn sets. Okay. I shall finish there, but I would just encourage you that if um, if all this was new to you a month ago, you shouldn't expect to uh, <laughs> find it easy now or find, I mean, in some sense, I've been talking about elementary things, but absorbing them and really understanding them and seeing them all from the very many different points of view that exist, it takes a lifetime of practice because you're constantly passing backwards and forwards in this duality. and Every time you do something on the geometric side, you you go in the opposite direction on the algebraic side. So if you have a map on one side, you have a pullback map on the other side. And um, if ever you think you understand everything, that's probably because you're just unplugging your brain and only working on one side. And then you're immediately losing the intuition and power of the other side. And you should never do that. It might work for, I don't know, uh, master's exercises or exams but it won't work in research you always have to pack, pass backwards and forwards between both sides you can never be happy with understanding it from one point of view you always have to understand it from every point of view and it just it's hard it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of getting used to and don't worry about it just just uh believe in the process it's it still confuses me and I still spend hours getting confused about some stupid little point about polynomials. And it's always good for me when I do it. So um, keep at it. Okay, thank you.